After that little interlude, uh, yeah, I'd like to talk to you about N. So, actually, many years ago, I had a couple of experiences which made me think very differently about endings. So, uh, I was experiencing a product called Wildfire, which was on Orange, which was a mobile phone operator. And um, it was a voice avatar, sort of, and it would handle all your phone messages long before smartphones when people left voice calls. And uh, it promised to be all sorts of wonderful organization. So I'd be able to interact with it through voice and speak to it and ask it to play my messages. But really, Wildfire was hopelessly disappointing. It, um, it couldn't hear me properly, so it would always respond to me with, sorry, I don't understand you. Sorry, I don't understand you. And it was so frustrating. I, I began to feel like I wanted to get real satisfaction in in um, ending it. I didn't want to just leave it and um, you, the usual sort of service ending. I wanted the emotional satisfaction, a conclusion. I wanted to throttle it. It was so horrible. Another thing I was doing at the time was teaching. And this was in uh, way back sort of 2004 or And I set, I guess, a cliche project to a design, a bunch of design students. And we all went away. And then we all came back with more things in the world this this brief was about waste and rubbish and and the answer to the brief was we created more things and this vocabulary and this lack of ending i found really interesting but also very disappointing that we didn't have a language for ending and offboarding consumer experiences so over the last decade or so I've been looking into this. And in the last two or three years, I left my job and I've been doing it full time, like looking into and share, sharing. I wrote a book on it and I've been traveling all over the place talking and sharing this idea with people. I found it super interesting and um, want to share it with you now. So let's talk, talk about endings. Right. Any consumer experience can be broken down into three stages, onboarding, usage and offboarding. And if we map that onto the engagement model of the consumer, we can see through sort of starting experiences as we onboard to a consumer experience through advertising, we get told a story, marketing orientates us, packaging reveals that product experience, T's and C's, make an agreement about the story that we've been told. We then enter a period of usage and over a period of time, we get a little bit bored of, that product or service and maybe as a provider we'd get we add new product services to our portfolio and we all get a bit bored and the experience starts to become very dull at the offboarding we forget it we're too excited getting back to a new starting experience so we experience these things as emotional death or sometimes we're not allowed to these things linger on forever in our homes and our society and sometimes we're not allowed to leave things at all it's very much overlooked this part of the consumer experience but this goes back way in our history this isn't just a modern occurrence let's think about what life was like long long time ago hundreds of years ago imagine yourself digging up mud in a field it was cold it was grim you were hungry impoverished disease was rife Death was a common occurrence. Everyone around you is dying all over the place. You had a rich vocabulary about it and you believed in all sorts of principles around death because you wanted to get to heaven. Now, heaven in many religions offers similar sorts of aspects. So it has abundance, it's warm, it's friendly. These sort of things are in high contrast to the life we were leading then. So we were desperate to get there. And to get there, we followed very explicit and meaningful rituals. And our funerals and the way we died were really important. But then the plague came along, 1347, decimated most of Europe. A third of Europe's population died within three years. Death became everywhere and death became meaningless. And at the time, the Catholic religion was the dominant religion in Europe. And they were also t 
taking, there was a lot of corruption going on with the things called like indulgences, which was the Pope allowing people to sin if they gave money to the church. The church was getting enormously rich because many people were dying and leaving their, leaving their estates to the church. So there was a lot of questions around the Catholic religion and also a lot of challenging religions coming up. One of those challenger religions was the Protestants. Now the Protestant uprising happened and they had some different aspects to how they believed people should worship and believe in God. One of those was fasting. Now in most religions, organized fasting is a part of that religion. So in, we'd have a period of time over the whole year where we'd fast and give thanks to having abundance. But in the Protestant religion, it was removed very early on by Martin Luther. This, to a certain degree, has lost our skill of having abstinence and, and relating to fasting. Another aspect and difference between the Catholic religion and the Protestant religion was jobs. Now, jobs in the Catholic religion, the valuable jobs were the Pope, a priest or a nun. All other jobs weren't so rich, but the, in the Protestant religion, you could do any job, whether you're an accountant or a carpenter or an interaction designer, they were valued because you were doing it in the right way. So it's the beginning of our career path. Also, investment was allowed in the Protestant religion. And if you'd done good investment and looked after society, then your business tended to get more money. And if you became wealthier and your, your business became more productive, you could give your employees more money. And they made a decision then. Should I work less time or should I buy more stuff? Now, the Industrial Revolution had started to provide more stuff to buy. And so we started to buy in abundance. And at the same time, in medicine and science starts to push back on death. Mortality rates drop. And our experience of death as witnesses and watching our dying loved ones is getting pushed away as we relinquish that control to sort of services. So things like hospitals and hospices, our experience of death as a, as a witness becomes more distant. And this removes our experience and provides us this opportunity to consume a heaven-like abundance on earth without experiencing ends and having a distance from them. So where we had this rich and valuable vocabulary around endings, we now end up in this where they're hidden, overlooked and unwanted. So you're probably thinking, my God, this is quite, what are we doing here talking about all this stuff? What's that got to do with UX and sustainability? Well, actually, it's very interesting. So I'm going to tell you about some modern endings that I can give you a bit more of a context around. So let's look at those. Let's look at printer ink cartridges, for an example. My printer tends to run out of printer ink every five minutes, it seems. And um, as it does that, I've gone out and I've bought a printer ink cartridge and I bought it home. And I open it up and transfer it. And I'm standing there with a printer ink cartridge thinking, what shall I do with that? I can't chuck it in landfill, it's highly toxic. How do I recycle it? And I'm thinking, well, I'm sure it has some information on the back of the pack. So I look on the back of the pack, but no, it has two bits of marketing material which suggest I start a new relationship with them. Then I think it's also got this word zodandathol, which is a dense chemical, which is really bad for the environment. Knowing that isn't actionable to me in that context. What I need to know is what I should do with this printer ink cartridge. So I go online and actually this company, this printer ink cartridge company, has been having a very good off-boarding or recycling program for many years. And I have to fill in the form and then get this envelope sent to me and which I can then send this cartridge back to them. Now, in this experience, I've had to off find an off-boarding experience, which was hidden to, from me. I've had to action that off-boarding experience and create that whole aspect myself. Otherwise, I would have been left with loads of printer and cartridges. Now let's look at another product. 
the consumer electronic industry. This is HTC One's mini packaging from a couple of years ago. Now, when we look at the packaging, especially of consumer electronics, it looks very idealistic, heavenly almost. It says boldly on the back, eco-friendly packaging, 98% recyclable. It's printed with soy ink. I'm feeling very good about this. But none of this relates to the offboarding experience or the end of the product inside, which on average is 18 months, it seems. There's only one aspect on here which talks about that. Now, this little wheelie bin icon, which I'm hoping you can see there, which suggests to the consumer, don't put it in the bin. And as I pointed out earlier, and I'm sure you, you know, you can't have an unactionable action. So don't do something isn't a button we'd be creating. This actually isn't just that. This is the we directive symbol. And I've been asking this, if anyone recognizes that symbol as the we directive symbol on every conference I've done. Nearly 5,000 people I think I've asked in, in the last few, the last half year I've been talking. Now, if we don't know about this, that's a big problem because this symbol allows me as a consumer to, to um, take back any consumer electronic, give it to the seller or reseller, and they take it back into the ecosystem, the manufacturing ecosystem, and dismantle it appropriately. But if the consumer doesn't know that, what's the point? That offboarding experience is hidden again. And even with more recent digital industry, where we're encouraged so much to create content and share content, we're also making mistakes here, where if I create something and I have no control over it, at the later stages, then is, it any ex is there any surprise that something like revenge porn starts to emerge? One in 10 young women are threatened with it in the US. So this is a problem across all of the consumer landscapes, whether it's in products or services or digital. But why do emotional endings? Well, actually, we've been doing emotional endings in all sorts of other narrative structures for many years, and they're very, very valuable. Our stories, our theater, our films all have very, com very compelling and very important things that happen at the end. They create meaning. Elizabeth MacArthur, for example, says about endings in narratives, attempts to preserve the moral and social order which would be threatened by endlessly earing narratives. Now I think about that in relationship to mis-selling on financial services. And I think there is a moral and social order which is disrupted by not having a conclusion to that. And then we, leave, we look at this one. Solid closure and conventional narratives and history satisfies this individual and social desire for moral authority, a purposeful interpretation of life and genuine stability. And then I think of that and what we've been doing with carbon and climate change. And I think of the lack of stability, the challenge to life that that's going to bring, and the disruption to moral authority. So let's look at that in the consumer context and how the beginning has been drifting away from the end for many centuries. So imagine back in the 15th century, consumer experiences and your relationship with waste and closure were actually very closely knitted. Your experience of what you consumed and the waste from that was very close. So what was on the kitchen table, the waste of which could be fed to the animals and the waste of the animals could be then put onto the field. This was a circle that we could see, we understood. It was actionable at every point. And the consumer experience and the conclusion and the closure experience were very coupled. But two things have been happening over those centuries. We've had a quickening of consumption, which has also tethered our identity, firstly through banking with identities for credit, and then more recently through emotional identity, through things like likes and emotional alignment with brands. At the same time, we've been distancing ourselves from waste and the aspect of waste that is controllable and understandable and emotional to us. 
Let's look at those things. So quickening. Products start to be manufactured at scale in the Industrial Revolution. Department stores start to allow us to see, see things which are um, gathered together instead of going to all sorts of tradespeople. <coughs> and modern advertising allows us to um, have a dream and understand what we're doing and have an aspect of like, I want to purchase this to fulfill my dreams. Progressive obsolescence allows me to throw away items before they're worn out or broken just because I might want a new one. Banking allows me to grab credit now. And so with this, I can start to understand, like, and afford all sorts of things. We create a whole new landscape with the World Wide Web. One click shopping introduces that as a faster process. And it, obviously, the click is a whole back end to that, which is quite innovative. And the type of things we're consuming now isn't just a product or a transaction or a financial obligation, it's a social thing, and we're sharing all sorts of content. So at the same time, we distance ourselves from waste. And this starts the Industrial Revolution again, as we start to manufacture things as an individual, I start to lose control of the waste I create in the industrial, in the industrial machine. My understanding of what waste is, is getting challenged by things like the concept of germs, something which is invisible, uncontrollable for me as a consumer. And I start to have real problems understanding that. It almost professionalizes waste. The things that we create, the chemicals we create, things like Silent Spring with Rachel Carson, we realize that they can go into the food chain and really challenge the consumer. And things like, Going to, the, going to the moon wasn't just about us getting to the moon. We turned around and saw the Earth as a vulnerable thing in space. This may, made us think about how important it was for us to look after the Earth. And it kick-started the Green Revolution. The Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change created 1988, and we're still questioning the offboarding of climate, of, of carbon, rather, with climate change. And even the biggest systems that we create on Earth as humans, we can deny an ending to when we say things like too big to fail with toxic banks. We don't know, even know how to unravel a thing we've created ourselves. And I'm sure many of you have tried to calculate your carbon footprint, and it's nearly impossible to do it accurately right to the nth degree. And finally, right to be forgotten with allows us to start to take ownership of the things we create online. But it's super hard to embed that if we don't create interfaces that allow us to offboard the content that we've created. So reflecting on these two things again, we see this quickening of consumption is tethering our identity, begins and it creates enormous emotional noise where the idea of waste and endings and offboarding has been distanced and faded. So where we had this close coupling in the 15th century, it's broken apart now. It's created almost a psychosis amongst us where we've had a consumer self is delighted to take consumer experiences and enjoy them. Yet a civil self challenges about waste and closure and is concerned about the environment. These two people can live in the same body where I can happily buy a ticket for a flight across the world. Yet at the same time, I can go on Facebook and make a load of noise about plastic waste in the, in the sea. These two things don't really come together in the consumer experience. The noise of which is for the onboarding, the message, the shouting that we hear about onboarding is overwhelming and it's drowning out that civil self around offboarding and responsibility. We see this reflected in something as simple as our homes. The average US household has 300,000 things in it, from paper clips to ironing boards. And the reflection of this and the amount of 
consumption we're still doing and we can't stop becomes an enormous burden for the buildings that we have. So we start using offsite storage. Offsite storage, the construction of these new buildings is starting to accelerate quite a bit in the last few years. Let's look at sustainability in more detail and why I think it really needs an ending. So this is a urinal. It's in Helsinki at a conference center. And it says boldly to the user of the urinal, this urinal is 100% ecological and saves at least 100,000 liters of fresh water per year. Now, looking at this, I think, well, that's a very, that's a great sentiment. However, it's presented on a backlit screen which is powered all day. And I think to myself, that's a lot of power going into that. And I don't really think it balances out. And I dig into the business model of the company, Euromat, and they're gonna push advertising through this screen while people at the urinal. And it makes this strange oxymoron of this urinal, which is very ecological, apparently 100% ecological, yet it's going to sell people all sorts of things through that medium. And this is the convoluting, strange place we're in, where we've only got one story left to tell. And this is the story of carry on consuming, because we've lost the story of abstinence. And we've lost that vocabulary of endings. So the only place we can create the noise to be listened to is by telling ourselves that consuming is the best way out of sustainability. This is sort of reinforced by William McDowell and Michael Bramber's book in Cradle to Cradle, which I think is a really admirable book and they do some fantastic work in the manufacturing component of the consumer life cycle. However, I found the book overlooks aspects of consumption in terms of a consumer experience and with that we start to sell ourselves into the routine of consumption that we're currently in. We tell ourselves and we're using the language which quite honestly has been used for hundreds of years to sell something new. We're using the language of the new, new processes, new materials, new products and we are at risk of creating an environment which sells sustainability and circular economy type products, potentially as Black Friday deals when they're not getting shifted enough. This again would be the oxymoron of sort of sustainability and wouldn't, in my opinion, be the right method. We also experience this with corporate social responsibility, where as a consumer, or a, or a person in society, I need to purchase something. So it allows a company to action environmental improvements as a proxy for me. It pushes the consumer onboarding and distances my individual responsibility for offboarding. Where I could have an experience about offboarding and an actionable role in that as a consumer but hiding it behind corporate social responsibility, such as things that we used to do with carbon offsetting for flights, where I could click a box and then have an uh, opportunity to rebalance that. And this circular economy is lacking a consumer ending, in my opinion. So where we have a whole life cycle, which is based on the system life cycle, which is manufacturing, assemblage and presentation to the consumer the consumer life cycle we know very familiar onboarding usage and there we're missing offboarding so let's look into that a bit more as i purchase a product and if i'm looking towards a sustainable purchase i'm looking to buy a circular economy product and i want to buy that product 
from a company which has great CR, CSR policy. And I'm hoping that product is made of safe and nutrient rich materials. And at that point, I've had to consume to get to move forward with my intention to be have a good sustainability. Once those products are purchased, where do they drift off to? They're going to go into my usage and then at some point they're going to have to be offboarded. Now, I'm also told to reuse things to get the best use out of them. I agree, that would be great. I'm also told I can repair things to get also a long use out of them and recycle things appropriately. But these messages are outside of the consumer experience. The message of reuse goes against the emotional consumer model that we've signed up for at the beginning of purchase. Repair becomes almost impossible through the complexity of devices and the warranties which are attached to those devices. And if we need to do recycling, we're going to have to do recycling in better, more engaged ways that allow us as consumers to break apart things and be engaged in that process to make sure we break things apart accurately. How are we going to do that? We need to engage people with a consumer life cycle that's We need to draw these messages together and make this consumer life cycle an emotional offboarding experience. We need to use the same language and tools as onboarding. And it needs to be inside the customer life cycle, not outside speaking to the civil self, but we need to attach the consumer self. I can't really sign up for a message which is a sustainable consumer has to buy more stuff. I believe a sustainable consumer needs to have an ending and reflect on their actions. And it has to be attached to the beginning of the consumer life cycle. So what will a good closure experience be? I believe it's attached. It's consciously connected to the rest of the experience through emotional triggers that are actionable by the user in a timely manner. Let's dig into some of those. Consciously connected. So this is Epson's paper lab. It's a paper pulping station, which is uh, meant to be in your office. I guess it's not a home office, it's probably a legal office because it's obviously enormous. You can put old bits of paper in one end and it's going to pulp it there and then and bring out new bits the other end. You can see it there and then. Where a lot of our recycling uh, experiences of paper recycling at home, uh, um, the office is usually put it into a recycling, a paper recycling bin that gets picked up. It goes on a truck off to the pulping station, gets put into reams, then cut into different A sizes, and then puts into a stationary company who repackages and sends it back to us. It's not a visible experience in that sense. This is seeing the ending of a product and its rebirth into a new product. It's a far more engaging emotional experience for the consumer. Emotional triggers. So this is Marie Kondo. She's a declutterer from Japan. I'm sure some of you might have read her book. It's really well worth reading and I think has a lot to say about sustainability and consumption. So definitely recommend it. So um, she recommends to her, her customers to take out the clutter of their cupboards and stuff and put them into piles of subjects. So all your books, all your all your shoes and all your coats, for example. And then you pick up each one and you say, does it bring me joy? And really ask that question, do I get delight from it? And if you don't, then you put it into a pile to be disposed of. And that pile to be disposed of, you go to, and you pick up every one and you say thank you to it. So for example, some hiking boots, I'll pick up the hiking boots and I say, Thank you to the hiking boots 
for making me feel comfortable and allowing me to get grip as I climb up the hill. We are now going to say goodbye and then you put them into the right containers. Now, when I say to that to people in the West, it sounds crazy, but we say hello to things all the time. Saying goodbye can help bring emotional engagement and reflection about the consumption I've had. And it's an important aspect to start designing that into our consumer experiences. Actionable. Plastic bottle deposits. So I think these are great. And there's a question around this in the UK at the moment, thinking they should bring them in, which is a no brainer, I think, for many people. It's a, insane that they don't bring them in already. So in Norway, for example, 98, 97% of bottles are being recycled because they create a plastic bottle deposit scheme. So the consumer goes to the shop, buys a bottle, and on top of the purchase price, there's a deposit, a small amount. You then leave the shop, consume the, consume the bottle, and then you re reclaim that deposit as you put it into one of these deposit machines. This is a wonderful experience because it connects the consumer between the onboarding experience and the offboarding experience. I'm engaged in both in an even way. It also allows this to be actionable to the consumer, which is encouraging. Timely. Kaya cars came to market about 10 years ago, and they offered a thing called the seven year warranty. Now, up to that point, many companies were offering a product warranty, a product quality warranty, which was more around two years. So a product would be good, like the ball bearings are good, or the door sounds really good. They didn't offer something that's seven years. Now, this blew the market, and it was such a disruption. One of the things which I think is fascinating about this is one of the reasons why it's good, in my opinion, especially as a closure experience, is that people find it hard to think beyond five years. So when you start to say to somebody, seven years, you can buy this product and bring it back in seven years, and um, you're basically inviting someone back to a funeral of that product. People can't think beyond that. That's seven years is too far to think. And you're basically suggesting product death. So when that person comes back in seven years' time, they drive onto the forecourt of Kaya, and then they park up. Kaya can then reclaim those materials, have a really wonderful discussion with that consumer about how great that seven years were, and they're probably very fertile for another sale. And so you've got this great ending to that product experience. So what can you do about it? Well, I hope in many things, these are some of the suggestions and some of the things that I put forward in some of the workshops I do. So uh, think about it. Hopefully I've given you some food for thought around like what endings are and how closure experiences work. And um, you've been inspired by that. <coughs> uh, and you can get the book and go onto the website and have another look at certain aspects of it. I also hope you can go and talk about it to some of your colleagues. Now, this is gonna be a lot more difficult than you imagine. I've been trying to talk to about endings and consumer experiences for, for a long time, and it's really difficult. We're in a society and certainly a business culture which isn't very tolerant to think about consumers leaving an experience. And with that, it becomes quite upsetting to discuss it. But you can do some practical steps, and this is some of the stuff we also do in the workshop. So you can audit what you've currently got. Do you have a conscious ending in your business, in your product experience? Is there anything beyond the legal accepted endings that you would think? You can start asking these questions. Who is empowered at the moment the transaction? Now, as a consumer, you might be empowered, but also as businesses, we sometimes lock out the consumer so they're not empowered. How does the product service descend? 
how does that get revealed, that offboarding experience? Are they acknowledged at the beginning of that offboarding experience? How do you hand back aspects of it? How do you dismantle it? What type of ending do you have? And do you have an aftermath target? We often talk about focusing on target users, but we never think about the aftermath target of that experience. What's that consumer going to walk away with? How do they feel emotionally about it? Well, we're too busy getting the next new customer. They have to live with that experience for the rest of their life, potentially. You can also map your current consumer experience. And as, <clears throat> as you might in a, in a film genre, you can see how a projection of what the proposal is of that consumer experience is at the very early stages, that would be advertising. And then you get something like a commitment, which is things like T's and C's, and that first use component out of the box. But we, are, we very rarely think about what's the last use of that product? How does that product break apart? How do you hand back data and relinquish control of that, con that consumer? How do we provide them an opportunity to reflect about that? experience they had. Was that a nice experience? Another aspect is planning it in. And I think this is a really important part of, of getting that into your, your product early on. I recommend just a fraction of time, 5% of your project time, you can think about how your product or service is going to end. If you think about five years out, for example, that's almost certainly going to have a component of product death. And of course, we can think about how it's designed. It's going to be consciously connected to the rest of the experience through emotional triggers that are actionable by the consumer in a timely manner. And that's the end. Now, the books on Amazon, you can go and get that at any point. And there's also ebooks on iBooks, Smashwords, and Amazon. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks very much.